There are three announcements this morning. Firstly, today there is a plenary indulgence granted to those who publicly recite the act of consecration of the human race to Jesus Christ the King. We'll be doing this uh, as a community at the end of the procession. Also this Tuesday, November 1st, is a, the Feast of All Saints and the Holy Day of Obligation. Masses will be at 7.20 a.m., 10 a.m., and 7 p.m. And then also this week, um, there are a couple of plenary indulgences only applicable to the Holy Souls in Purgatory at the beginning of November. Um, so please see the bulletin for details. All these indulgences are under the usual conditions. I am a king. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Our Lord tells Pilate these words in today's gospel, witnessing to the fact that he is an, indeed a king. And about a hundred years ago, in 1925, it was the 1600th anniversary of the Council of Nicaea. And in that council, during that council, the words cuius reini non erit finis were added to the creed, the creed that we, we pray at each Sunday Mass. And on the occasion of this 1600th anniversary of that council, so in this year 1925, Pius XI, he wrote an encyclical, Quas Primas, in which he established this feast. And he established that this feast of Christ the King be celebrated starting with the coming year and to be yearly uh, renewed. And so this feast, it's, it's not ancient, you can say, it's, it's not even been a hundred years, it's about a, almost a hundred. Um, but we can also see in this feast that it's not some new doctrine or new emphasis that Pius XI is creating. And rather it's one of the most ancient doctrines which God has revealed concerning Jesus Christ. And we have witness to the kingship of Christ, both in the Old and in the New Testaments. We see it throughout the text of today's Mass, these, uh, these references to the kingship of our Lord, and taken from books of the Old Testament and the New. And just a few examples from the Old, we have Psalm 71, which we prayed in the introit, where we speak of our Lord and we say that he shall rule from sea to sea unto the ends of the earth. So his, his kingship, he will be king from sea to sea unto the ends of the earth. We also have Isaiah in the Old Testament telling us that when our Lord comes, he shall sit upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom from henceforth and forever. So his kingship will be eternal. And a final example from the Old Testament is the prophet Daniel, which we have in uh, the, the, the chant between the epistle and gospel today. And Daniel, he tells us concerning our Lord, and he gave to him power and glory and a kingdom. His power is an everlasting power and his kingdom shall not be destroyed. So this idea of the redeemer, of the Messiah being king is perhaps the the most obvious characteristic that the New Testament prophesied concerning the Redeemer, right? The Jews at the time of our Lord, they were expecting, they were waiting for a king. That's, that's one thing they did understand, they did know about the Messiah. They knew he was going to be king. And so the Old Testament, again, witnessed to this, witnesses to this fact thoroughly. But then we also have the New Testament. And right at the beginning, at the Annunciation of the Angel Gabriel to Our Lady, which began the, the Incarnation, Gabriel, he's speaking to Our Lady, and he tells her that she's going to be the Mother of God, right? She's going to bear a son. And he gives a few characteristics concerning her son, one of which he says, of his kingdom there shall be no end those words that we have in the creed. Right? It's, a, it's a dogma of faith that Jesus Christ is king. And the angel Gabriel told Our Lady that at the moment of the incarnation. He will be a king, and his kingdom shall not have an end. 
And we see our Lord himself publicly witnessing to this fact, always speaking about his kingdom, right? In all his parables, he speaks about the kingdom of heaven, talks about what it's like, what it's not like. And he's constantly teaching this truth that he is king. And eventually on this, this last day of his life, which we have in today's gospel, we have him very straightforwardly telling Pilate, I am a king. It's one of the most, say, profound sentences that he spoke. And so our Lord, he's, he's king, and he's king everywhere and for all time. And this isn't something new. And this isn't a, a auxiliary truth of the faith. It's something that God wished to reveal, we can say almost from the beginning. Throughout the whole Old Testament, this king is going to come. And throughout the New Testament, Jesus Christ proclaiming he is king, and the church echoing that proclamation until the end of time. And so as king, our, our Lord, he has all power. Right? He has legislative power, executive, judicial. Right? Legislative, he, he makes laws. Our Lord has the power to make, law, to make laws, and he exercises that power. Our Lord does have commands, he has demands, and he requires us to follow them. And our Lord, he tells us, if you love me, keep my commandments. The, thing I, the things I tell you to do, do them. And then he has executive power, right? He enforces his commands, right? He's all powerful, he uses his, his, uh, yeah, his omnipotence. And then of course, he also has judicial power. He's the one who will judge. He's going to come a second time just as judge in order to judge good and evil, to judge the blessed and the wicked. And with regard to this kingship of our Lord, this universal, eternal kingship, we have two options. Either we believe that he's king over all creatures and everyone must love and obey him as he providentially commands us, or we don't believe that. There's no, there's no third section. There's no third party that we can, that we can give our allegiance to. It's, it's one or the other. There is no reconciling the dogma of Christ the King with the error of liberalism or with the other modern errors of religious liberty or ecumenism or collegiality. It's either Christ is the King or he's not the King. And, and you, there's, there's, no, there's no reconciling. There's, there's no middle ground. And Pius X and Pius XI saw this this these two camps saw this clarity, or with clarity, this situation of either Christ is the king or he's not, and they, they labeled that as the, the great era of their time, the great era of, of modern times, right? Pius X gave as the solution to, to put Jesus Christ as the head, right? In his first encyclical, he says we have to, to rehead everything in Christ, or to put him at the head of everything. That's the only solution. That's the only way to live a Catholic life. That's the only way to profess this, this doctrine, this dogma, that Christ is the King. And Pius XI, following on, a few years after Pius X, saw again this, this doctrine of Christ the King being a, a key doctrine in fighting the modern heirs and combating the dissolution of society. And in his encyclical Quas Primas, he decides to institute a yearly feast which we're celebrating today. And the church, with the, throughout time with the creation of liturgical feasts, she does so um, depending on the, the needs of, of the time, the needs of, of the people, the needs of the faithful. And so we see throughout the, the history of, of the liturgy and the liturgical year, and the feast that we celebrate, this link with, with the, the current uh, events in, in the world or in the church. For example, early on, the church instituted many feasts of martyrs, and it was because it was a time of martyrdom. It was a time when the faithful needed to be prepared to be martyred. And so the church would celebrate these feasts of the martyrs in order to give courage 
to strengthen those who, who were going to be martyred. And then later on, different feasts, different liturgical feasts are instituted in order to, uh, to revive uh, something that had fallen off or to, to fix a certain tendency. For example, the Feast of Corpus Christi was instituted at a time when devotion to the Holy Eucharist was waning. There wasn't this respect, this, this, this honor, this devotion being given to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament as, as he deserved. And so the church institutes a feast just on that truth, just on our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And we have later on also the Feast of the Sacred Heart, which was a result of the combat against Jansenism, when the love of God was being obscured, when hope of salvation um, was uh, was, was being put in, in the background or, or squashed. The church said, no, we, we need to remind the faithful yearly of this truth of the sacred heart, of, of the love of God, of, of the hope of salvation. And so Pius XI takes this same strategy the church has used throughout her history and says that we need to have a feast that reminds everyone annually that our Lord is king of individuals and of society. And he says a yearly feast will do more good than a solemn pronouncement. If he just wrote a, a letter, a pronouncement, even an uh, you know, extraordinary definition, he says that, that that wouldn't affect individual souls, it wouldn't affect us as much as a yearly feast, because something that happens once is soon forgotten. So even if he made a very solemn declaration, that would have much less effect than a yearly remembrance of this truth. And so he wants this feast every year in order to, to wake us up to this truth, to see if this truth is, is central in our Catholic life. Right? To, to ask the question to ourselves whether Christ is reigning in us and around us, right? in our minds, wills, and hearts, and in our communities. And yet this doctrine, which we celebrate today in a special manner, it's something that's not only celebrated today. It's not a, uh, a, a truth that's specific to today. And in fact, the whole liturgical year in it, uh, we see the church constantly teaching us, constantly impressing upon us the truth that Christ is the King. And we see that at, at every feast of, of the church year. The church is constantly telling us, Jesus Christ is the King. All right, we start the liturgical year with Advent, and that whole time period is preparing for the King. Right? And the, the Jews, they, they knew a King was coming. They knew he was going to be King. It's one thing they, they did understand. And we enter that spirit during Advent, this yearning for the King to come. And then at Christmas, right, we adore the, the infant King. A lot of, of hymns to our Lord as, as King reigning from the crib. And then an epiphany, right? The kings from the east, they come and give their, their respects and, and they manifest the excellence, the higher excellence of the kingdom of our Lord. Then during Lent on Palm Sunday, when we have a, a Christ the King procession, just like today, we sing during that procession several times, Gloria laus et honor tibi sit rex Christe. Glory, praise, and honor to you, Christ the King. So that's the title we give him on Palm Sunday. And then on Good Friday, in the words of the liturgy, but especially on the cross itself when it's unveiled, it reveals the words written on the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King. And the church on that day tells us, look at the cross, ecce linium. Look at the cross. The cross tells you Christ is the King. And so though each year we, we celebrate in particular today the kingship of our Lord and this great truth of the faith, again, we celebrate it constantly. And we can say daily in such a way that every day is meant to be Christ the King. And even at each Mass, in the text of the Mass, right, we pray the Our Father, we pray thy kingdom come. We reference his kingdom every Mass. And in the collects and the secret and the post-communions, we always end those prayers or we, we ask God for something and we ask God for something through our Lord 
And then we call our Lord King. Every collect, we ask for a grace through Christ the King, right? We take him vivid et reignat, who reigns, through Jesus Christ, who reigns. And so let's ask today to, to resolve to really deepen our relation with this fundamental doctrine of the faith and this fundamental doctrine of our life so that we can pro proclaim in deed and in truth that Jesus Christ is the King, cuius reigni nonerit finis. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.